Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we are beginning with uh, our next panel discussion. Let me welcome you here again after the lunch break. I hope you enjoy the, the break and the, and the lunch. My name is Aneta Zachová and I am editor-in-chief of Euractiv uh, CZ, a uh, portal that is uh, dedicated to European Union affairs. And I am very happy that I can chair this uh, panel discussion about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on economy, healthcare, and society. And it's great that we can discuss impacts of COVID on these three specific issues with the great speakers we have here. So let me please introduce you, uh, Professor Danusha Nerdua, Rector of Mendel University in Brno. I am also glad that I can introduce to you uh, Mr. Martin Buchtík, uh, Director of Research Agency STEM. And it's also my great pleasure to welcome here Mr. Pavel Gruber, former Director of uh, Doctors Without Borders organization. So you can see that we have uh, one great expert on, expert on economy, one great expert on society, and one great expert on healthcare. So it will be very, very nice discussion, I hope. Uh, I would like to ask you to uh, send us your comments or not comments but more uh, questions as you know it or already you, you can uh, reach us via slido application with the hashtag simpo 2021 so on this slido website application you can find uh, our event and ask your questions to our speakers uh, before I will get the floor to you, uh, we will listen to the three first introductory remarks of our great speakers. And uh, as we agreed, uh, we will start with the presentation of Mr. Martin Buchtík, uh, Director of STEM Agency. So please, uh, Mr. Buchtík, you can, you can start your presentation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to briefly show you some graphs. And as, as far as I'm sociologist, I'm also known as a guy who knows what the graph shows. And uh, uh, a big walking Excel sheet, so with a lot of numbers. So let me show you some uh, basics. From the perspective of Czech society, the crisis has hopefully passed. What I want to tell you in seven minutes is that for most of people, the crisis did not bring new opportunities. The second thing, trust levels have plumped and many of us ended up in a hopeless situation. Third thing, overall, in general, Czech households were not significantly affected by the crisis although one, uh, already some vulnerable groups, ho however, were hit especially hard. So this is the basic. You can go back to your emails and to your phones if you like. Otherwise, uh, here we are. Um, especially if in the media, we can hear quite often that, that this is not a crisis. This is a quite big opportunity. Um, as you can see in graphs, for most of the people in the Czech Republic, it's not true. Especially for young people, it was quite deep crisis, one of the deepest crises in the last 30 years. Uh, unsurprisingly, travel and studying with kids were the most adversely affected by the crisis in, during last, last autumn. Uh, on the other hand, Czech's relationships with family and friends were less impacted by, by the crisis and by the pandemic and lockdowns. The, sec the second thing is trust in government, uh, government's ability to solve the crisis. It dropped, as you can see, quite sharply since the be very beginning of the crisis. The gray line shows uh, April 2020 in Czech Republic, it's uh, up. 
uh, upper upper line, and uh, 20, and they dropped from 83 percent to 25. You can see that in international comparison, it's the biggest drop in, over all over the world. Uh, it also led to the situation when no one trusted uh, government and members and ministries, and it was quite a big crisis uh, in com on communication level. You can see that uh, only alternative media in our measurement are on the lower level than mem members and of the government if we are talking about about trust in information source. On the other hand, um, nurses, university doctors, and general practitioners were highly appreciated even during the end of the crisis. Well, uh, all of this led to the um, to the worst crisis since the Velvet Revolution in this spring, I mean spring 2021, in the Czech Republic. There were multiple factors contributing uh, to the widespread societal disappointment. I wanted to show you some of them. During the winter 2021, there was an increase in shares of both those who thought the government measures should be stricted and those who considered, considered them out of proportion. So these measures were taken seriously by the society. On the other hand, uh, the disappointment was big from both sides. Uh, at the end, uh, here you can see the uh, index of household financial situation from the 1993 and till the May, till, till the May 2021, you can see that the crisis, the COVID crisis was also an economical crisis, but right now uh, Czech households feels that it's over. And in general, the general population is not affected a lot by the crisis. The index is on the, nearly on the same level as before the, the COVID situation. It means on the level of 19, 2019. On the other hand, there are quite large subgroups in society which uh, were impacted quite hard. And these groups are those who, are, who were vulnerable before the pandemic. Here we can show the example of uh, single parents, 90% of them are single mothers. Uh, during the crisis, more than 30% of single parent, parents' household had serious economical troubles. Contrary to that, only 13% only of Czech households had, had, uh, was in this situation. So the troubles were quite strong, even though also there were quite problematic situations in between single parents' household before the crisis. You can see that also before the crisis, there were 19% of households with single parents in uh, economical troubles. During the crisis, it was, as I have mentioned already, 31%. Well, how they are solving this situation, these single parents? But it, we can also talk about people with lower income, people, uh, retired people with low uh, pensions, and uh, also people with low education. Uh, every Ford household had troubles with, uh, had, had a hard time with repaying their debts, and about half of households uh, needed to save some money uh, on food, so they uh, they they uh, dealt with lack of finance by saving on food and saving on household expenses. Uh, around half of them and 13 percent went to bank loans. So that's all I want to mention at the beginning. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Buchtík, for this uh, presentation. So now we have, uh, like, we know what was happening in the society during the COVID-19 crisis. And I was quite surprised that, according to Czech society, the, the problem, the pandemic is over. For me, it was quite a surprise, because I don't think it is like that. But now let's move on on economy. Uh, please, uh, Ms. Nerudova, uh, could you tell us more about the impacts of COVID on the economy? Please, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for inviting me. Um, I decided to speak uh, in a broader context because the economics is also very much influenced by society and by, uh, by COVID itself. And before uh, giving you some picture of the impact on uh, economics in the Czech Republic, I would like to talk about uh, COVID as itself, about the fact that this pandemic has not uh, pointed out only on our immune systems, but it in fact pointed out on the essence of our society. It uh, pointed out on our freedoms. Uh, for the first time after the Second World War, we have been facing the fact that our freedoms has been limited to certain contact, to certain um, uh, extent. And this, of course, was something on which the society was not prepared. And this is something which extremely influenced uh, the behavior of the society. And also, it extremely influenced, uh, influenced business. And uh, what was in the Czech Republic, uh, what was the characteristic of last two years in the society and in the economic, is just one word, distrust. Distrust of the state in society and distrust of society into the state. And it had a lot of negative connotations because uh, regarding the, uh, the solution of the uh, impacts on the economics, our state has been extremely inefficient and the help was not, not fast enough and was not aimed precisely on the sectors which really needed the help. And this is the fact that with, which us as the economists, we have been speaking about this topic from the very first time, that not only we are really bad in the solution of, of, of the pandemic itself, but we are really very inefficient in providing help to people and to businesses. In every crisis, the, the rule uh, or the role of the state is boosting up. And the role in economic also of the state in this crisis boosted up. Uh, we, have been, uh, uh, we have been the businesses, a uh, lot of efforts of the state to enter into some companies and so on due uh, to the crisis. But um, we saw that the society thinks that the pandemic is over. I'm also very surprised, but uh, business thinks that, that the pandemic is really over, even though that they are facing, uh, facing the things still at the moment, uh, insufficient supply uh, of nearly everything and uh, disconnection of the global uh, supply change, chains. Uh, and now we are at the moment that also in the economics, we have to discuss the fact that it's the right time to limit the role of the state again in the economics and that we should uh, transform the state, which really boosted up in the last two years into the flexible state, which will be able to flexible react on all the challenges which are in front of us. Because ladies and gentlemen, this is not the last crisis our society is facing. Uh, what also COVID showed, uh, COVID was like a catalyst and revealed that the current economic model our society is living for is not functioning anymore. Because in the spring, we have been facing the lack of face masks. 
we have been lacing, uh, we have been facing the lack of any other uh, equipment for uh, for doctors. Uh, we have been threatened by the fact that uh, part of, for example, antibiotics are produced in India or China, and we 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 had really um, we have been facing the fact that maybe there is going to be not enough of this stuff because. Uh, we completely forgot that uh, it's very important to have in our minds also the safety, health safety, food safety and any other safety. Because the only driver of our economic model at the moment was the GDP growth. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm not even talking about the climate change because this is also something which, which, uh, which is on the spot at the moment because COVID also revealed the fact that if we will continue to behave as we do, we are going to have a serious problem. So that's why we in the economics are talking about the fact that probably uh, we are on the edge of the change of paradigm in economics and probably uh, we are going to have a new economic model which will uh, cover also health safety, food safety uh, and things, uh, things like this which are very much connected with resilience for example, of uh, European Union, because we can't be resilient if uh, we are not taking uh, about health safety, for example, taking into account uh, health safety. What also have revealed uh, COVID is that for the Czech Republic, a small country in the heart of Europe is extremely necessary um, to be very active in the international cooperation. COVID showed that uh, we are not able to act as a single country. We need to be the part of some broader union to be able uh, to, uh, to get the best from, from the economic of the state. So also international cooperation uh, was the fact which, which or the importance of the international cooperation was the fact which revealed, uh, which revealed uh, COVID. And um, for the last, I think that COVID revealed uh, how blind we are regarding um, taxing the digital sector. COVID showed, out, showed uh, us that uh, there are many digital companies uh, which were running huge profits during COVID because our society went online. But uh, the policymakers, uh, they do not have any tool how to tax those businesses, and they are a very substantial part of the economics of the Czech Republic. So that's my first introductory remarks and food for uh, the discussion at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, great contribution to our debate. I have already a few questions on my mind, but I will keep them for later, because I would like to now ask uh, our third speaker, uh, Mr. Pavel Gruber, to, to, uh, to take the floor and tell us more about the impacts on the healthcare. Please, the floor. Okay, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, also from my side. Uh, it's a bit difficult to be the third one because actually uh, I had one word in my mind which I wanted to mention several times. I wanted to make kind of the comparison of the experience which I have from different epidemics in the world, be it the Ebola in West Africa, be it the measles, cholera in Haiti. And there is one striking thing which is similar to the, to the current situation we did face here and that was mentioned by both my predecessors that the trust. Every epidemiologist, every humanitarian worker tells you that if you want to successfully handle any, any epidemics, the trust of the local population is key. And we are the local population in this case, we should remember it. And uh, uh, it was mentioned here, uh, I think if there was the trust that the things are managed well, that the leadership knows what, uh, what they are doing, maybe it was their April, May 2020, and then it was over. 
Uh, so I think it's like the connecting uh, connecting factor for, for, for the failure which which happened here. Compared to the others, I don't think the situation we did face was as unique as everybody thinks because uh, we had huge uh, epidemics before uh, and we couldn't learn from them and we didn't. So uh, I have like different highlights, but this is one of them. If, if there is anything to take out of it, is we really heavily relied on, epi on epidemiologists and on medical doctors and we should have created multidisciplinary teams because if you want to gain the trust of the society, you need also other perspectives. You need the earth perspective on the, of the anthropologist, of the sociologist, economists, and the others. There are so many factors about the society. You can play with the, with the loose and tight societies, with the level of collectivism. And these are important factors for how you approach the population to to get the trust and to keep it, because it's always much uh, much easier to lose it, to lose the trust, than than to get it. So <clears throat> this this would be one of, one of my and and the communication. So this would be one my thought uh, uh, from from let's say the health per health perspective. My second thought is coming still back. If you close your eyes and we come back to to February March 2020. Uh, the situation is quite stable in Czech Republic. We see in the news about some pandemics in China, and we see situation in Italy is getting worse and worse. Uh, Italy is asking for help, and uh, what our country does is say no. There is a zero level of the solidarity, and it's coming again and again. Well, what this country is showing within the group of friends of the EU, that uh, we show zero level of solidarity. However, we always expect that there will be solidarity with us. Why I do mention this? Because at this moment, it interestingly flipped around. It was only 12 months, and Czech Republic was in the position of Italy. And what happened? The aid started to pour in, the ventilators were coming, or at least the offer of the aid, the teams were offered. And I think this is a lesson we should not forget. We should not forget, and we must keep it in our minds, how short vision and selfish is not to provide the, the assistance to friends when we came and to show the solidarity. Because in March 20, uh, 2020, we had the capacities to provide the support. We could do it easily with zero risk to our population. It was just the fear of the politicians, how it will be uh, anticipated or uh, how it will be seen by the public opinion. Which is actually when I first mentioned different uh, different epidemics from around the world, which is quite common. It was with Ebola, the situation was quite same. And and I must say, I must say, not only Czech Republic, but um, uh, this is a this is a different story. So I think it's one of the lessons we do not talk enough, but uh, we showed embarrassing uh, lack of solidarity, and and our European friends showed us a uh, very different face. I know Aneta was expecting from me some, some bit of local point of uh, view on the health system, which is a bit difficult because I'm not epidemiologist and I'm not doctor neither. So uh, my, my thoughts could be the thoughts of, let's say, in Fort Amateur. But I think I, I have two points here. Uh, it's interesting that the Czech Republic was one of the worst hit countries and still we somehow did manage. Of course, there is 30,000 dead, but uh, in terms of the of the healthcare system we did manage why we did manage i think there are two two key factors which contributed to the fact that the system did cope with first is often uh, mentioned it's the enormous effort of all the medical paramedical and non-medical personnel in the hospital we do not talk that much about the second factor, and this is the fact that we have one of the highest density of hospital beds and highest density of hospitals in Europe. And only, only because of this combination, we were not confronted with the situation that the TB would show us patient lying in the front halls of the hospital, that the patients would be staying in, on mobile beds in front of the hospitals, because otherwise, if we do not have this abnormal density of hospital beds, this would, we would be faced and we would be confronted with these pictures we were not. And what, what to take out, out of it? I think there is one risk for me. Uh, the risk is that this uh, argument will be used to cement the system. 
uh, which would be quite unlucky because this is the system which worked well in extreme situation, but in a normal situation is not really effective. And I know there is no simple solution is to just cutting the beds and hospitals because cutting a regional hospital is, uh, is super difficult and, and we must look for the smart solution. But, but I want to highlight it. We should not take it, okay, now it proved that it's well settled. It's not. Uh, then, for me, there is a second factor, and it was also mentioned in, in the data of Mr. Boutik, which is positive, uh, and this is, uh, I'm a bit older, so I remember the struggle of this country and the, all the discussions about the remuneration of the medical doctors in past 30 years, how to level it up, I think we somehow managed, but we never really talked about the remuneration and respect for the nurses. And for me, this crisis was an opportunity to change it, uh, to change the fact that I think the, the majority of the Czech population does not know that a general nurse means a university education, specialized nurse, uh, her education is on the level of a, of a doctor. So I think there is a really good opportunity to use it and, and build the respect for, for the nurses within the society. It's not only about the money, it's also about the respect. And I, I'm usually I finish this part with, with a fun fact, but which is interesting. If you read the studies or the predictions, what may be the impact of the introduction of artificial intelligence into the healthcare system, most of the predictions say, if you want to be on the safe side and do not want to lose your job, be rather a nurse than a doctor, because it seems it's much easier to replace a doctor with artificial intelligence than a nurse. So <laughs> it's probably quite far away, but uh, it's, it's an it's interesting thing. My last point, which I wanted to mention, because, well, I spent most of my professional life in non-governmental organizations, and one of the striking things for me how omitted the role of non-governmental non organization in this crisis was. They played, I think, quite a strong role in the social area, in the hospice area, in the, in the excluded communities. But if I look how the, how the state and how the administration played the role of the NGOs, was there any mapping? No. Was there any contacts? No. Did anybody try to, to see what they do? Did anybody try to get their expertise, which they had? And it could be expertise, of course, from handling the epidemics elsewhere in the world, but it's also the, the expertise with, with the communication, with gaining the, trucks, uh, with gaining the trust. With, uh, so th this, this role was completely omitted. And just an interesting thing was uh, some of the European countries knew that if there is anybody who has really practical experience with mass vaccinations, then it's humanitarian NGOs, because we are used to vaccinate hundreds of thousands of people in, in weeks. So some of the European countries did outsource the vaccination campaigns to NGOs, and it worked well. Here, the question was not even, uh, not even opened. And uh, I said this is the last point, but I cannot uh, step over my favorite topic, which I didn't want, didn't want to open, but since Ms. Nerudova mentioned the new economic paradigms, I think the one, one point we do not talk about is the vaccination and we, the, the need to look into the new economic paradigms about how vaccinations are financed and developed, because the fact that we have vaccines so quickly is an enormous success. But we do not look on the, on, the, on the second side, why it was so quick and why it was so successful. And this is not mentioned too often, but the fact is that the government of the United States and EU did finance most of the, uh, most of the research and development, and the profit goes to the private companies. There is no clausula, no question that the companies will share the profit if they are successful with those who did contribute it. And then there was the second point that the U.S. government did grant that if anything goes wrong, if there are any side effects, if there are any legal issues, they will be settled by the government, not by the private companies. And, you know, decreasing the level of the, of the risk for the private companies, it made for them super easy to do it. And it was a great success, but I think we should see the whole story uh, and, and discuss it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I know it's not easy task to talk about COVID because we are talking about COVID um, almost two years now. So uh, it's anyway, it's, it's great that 
all of you found something new, something, uh, some new insights in this uh, not very easy area. Uh, I would like to now again encourage our audience to ask question via Slido. You can find us in this room under hashtag Simbo2021 and uh, there you can ask questions to, to our panelists. Uh, I can already see uh, two questions in, in Slido. I will now start with my question and then we will proceed with the questions from our audience. Um, you all mentioned trust. Trust to governments, trust uh, to institutions. And um, Mr. Buchtik, in your presentation, you said that uh, we faced really a loss of uh, trust in the government. Uh, do you think that now Czech people, for example, found uh, something new, new institution or new whatever that they can trust now? Because I know that during the COVID crisis there was like quite strong role of regional leaders. For example, we saw that the, that the governors of the Czech regions were very active in uh, finding some kind of solutions. So do you think that now there is institution or something like that in Czech Republic that is that have uh, bigger trust of the Czech citizens than it has before the COVID crisis? Yeah, well, thank you for the question, but you are asking me two days before the election, so it's very difficult to answer. Uh, from my perspective, there is no such institution in the Czech Republic in general. Uh, but there are several uh, individuals who are quite trusted. Uh, maybe the majority of them are um, epidemiologists. I don't know, uh, even uh, Rastislav Magyar, for example. And so on, yeah, there are quite new uh, People in media, also Danusha Nerudova, uh, take, took her part in, in the COVID crisis and she was speaking about the economical impact. But the society is fragmented and divided quite uh, deeply. So we do cannot think about someone like uh, Tomáš Garik Masaryk or, or this one. This, on, in this style, so there are individual persons, there is no institution. Uh, if we look uh, outside the Czech Republic, do you think that because uh, now we or can get the vaccine uh, and the European Union is uh, providing its member states with va vaccines, do you think that, uh, for example, it, that it changed the trust when it comes to the European Union or international institutions as a whole, because, for example, the World Health Organization was also very active, very visible during the COVID-19 crisis. Do you think that uh, Czech people are now more aware, for example, of what these institutions are doing and uh, what can, like, which benefits can they bring? Well. Especially WHO is uh, perceived uh, as institution which is less, less trusted than at the beginning of the COVID. Uh, I think it's a global, global phenomena. Uh, talking about European Union, it depends. Uh, it, it is changing uh, very quickly. Uh, as, but I have to mention that Czech Republic is more the most skeptical nation in the whole European Union, toward the European Union itself. So it's very difficult to divide the skepticism uh, in general and uh, skepticism which led us to believe that um, European Union wasn't able uh, to bring us enough vaccines at the beginning, but European Union is able to bring us some bring us some money, so it's also important, especially in Czech, uh, public narrative where economical uh, aspects and money is the most important thing, uh, more important than I don't know uh, liberal versus conservative 
point of view as in Poland or more nationalistic or globalized uh, discourse in, uh, in Hungary. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you spoke about the European Union uh, and about money, the importance of money uh, when it comes to Czech society and our relationship with uh, the European institutions. I have now a quite interesting uh, question from our audience that is also a bit related to the EU. Uh, it's a question for Ms. Nerudova because you spoke about the new economic model. And the question is quite tricky because uh, it is that um, would this uh, new economic model possibly involve further steps to adopt euro, the common European currency? The model I have been talking in general is uh, in fact the, the, the model for Western society, not only for the Czech Republic, but at the moment discussion about the euro is on, not on the table due to fiscal expansion which did our government and the enormous that we are not fulfilling the Maastricht criteria. So first we need to fulfill the criteria, then we can discuss about uh, adoption of euro. So at the moment, even if we would like to have euro, we are not, it's not possible because we are not fulfilling the criteria. Just to add that uh, since the previous economic um, crisis, less than 20% of Czech public supports uh, adopting euro. And then I, I will add that in fact that's the political question, not the economic one, because the substantial part of the business in the Czech Republic is already using euro. So uh, it's really the political question, not the economic one. Uh, no, I just also wanted to react on the WHO because I think the situation with WHO, we are turning in a circle because uh, a lot of states and a lot of us is not really happy with the role WHO is playing or more with how it, how does it play the role and that leads to the defunding of WHO and because WHO is losing the funds then the quality of the delivery of WHO is going down. Interestingly uh, the special unit for, for infection diseases were dissolved due to the lack of the funding. Uh, so I don't know how to break the circle but but I just want to highlight it that we have this problem and it was it's a little bit similar with EU if you remember all of these calls like there should be the EU should be stronger in terms of coordination and so on well the problem is that is the national states who protect it's the national states which protect the healthcare and does not want to delegate uh, any authority in health issues to the EU including Czech Republic so it's like two circles where we were returning it Thank you very much. Uh, I have uh, one more question for you, Mr. Gruber, uh, from our audience. Uh, and the question is, uh, what would you say the Czech Republic could have learned from former crises uh, that uh, we haven't used so far? Uh, could you could you tell us, because I know you, you spoke already about this uh, kind of learning from the past. So could you be more specific, like what should we uh, really learn, like we, meaning the Czech Republic. I, I'm not sure if I can come up with more than, than I said, like, um, uh, yeah, I can just repeat. You, you are trying to solve not a medical issue, it's like a global crisis of the society with many aspects and that's why you need specialists from different areas and I think this is this was the, the point which was which was missing here so um, th this is probably uh, yeah we, we were very technicist like we thought we if we put in one room 20 excellent epidemiologists we get the solution but this is, this is not the way how we can do it you need to complement the epidemiologists with the others to get the right outcome uh, thank you. Uh, another question is related to what has been said and it is linked to what uh, Ms. Nerudova mentioned in her contribution and it's about the flexibility of the state. 
I think that maybe this flexibility is also in kind of uh, better cooperation between the government, with, between the experts, uh, academic sphere, business, that that is something that we really didn't have during the, the, the crisis. And um, the question from our audience is, um, how do you think the Czech government can transform itself into a more flexible institution mm -hmm. in terms of facing future challenges? Our audience has really great questions. <laughs> so please, uh, Ms. Nerudová, could you react? It's a really difficult question. And I would like to mention two things that um, uh, in last eight, ten years, uh, we don't have any culture of cooperation of government with experts. That's for the first. There is no culture. There is a culture in Germany, there is a culture in the United States, but there is no culture in the Czech Republic. And I'm not telling that it's just the fault of the government, because uh, the academics and experts, they do have uh, two roles and two tasks. First, they need to, uh, to do a popularization of the results of research and science. And this is something which we are doing, we are good at, and I think that it works perfectly. But the second role of the experts and academics is the communication. Communication with the policymakers. And this is something which is not functioning at all in the Czech Republic and has not been functioning during the crisis. And this is why uh, we were not being able to react so flexible because uh, experts failed to communicate with the policymakers and the government failed to listen to the experts. And, and the academics. So, um, well, I don't think that the government can change it uh, by itself. I think that the change uh, needs uh, to be a real professional one, which means reconsidering of the each individual uh, uh, agency which is, which is done by uh, government, because probably you know that certain agendas are dealt with two or three ministries, which is a great inefficiency. So this is what needs to, needs to be done. And the one, one more point which needs to be done, uh, the sharing of the information, even though we do have an act on sharing of the information between the uh, bodies of the government, in fact, it's not working. Uh, and those information are not only collected by each ministry itself, but is also analyzed by each ministry itself. And again, it's a great inefficiency. And for, for the third, uh, I think that the Czech participants are probably aware of the fact that I also have been um, the face of, of, of something which was a rather activist, give us the data, because uh, during the crisis, uh, government really, uh, or this crisis, uh, government failed to give data to experts. And again, this I consider as a great failure because it's very much connected then with distrust of the society because there was no relevant person in public space who could speak about because we had no data. And uh, I, I consider that also as an essential part to be open and to share data with the experts to get an analysis and the relevant uh, things or the relevant files for the policymakers. And this was something also which was not functioning at all during the crisis. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Buchtik, maybe a follow-up questions to you. Um, we are talking about data and uh, STEM is providing us with a lot of data. Uh, do you think that, uh, for example, the Czech government uh, somehow used uh, the data about the society when they were deciding on the measures? Because it was, uh, of course, question, especially before elections. <laughs> you already mentioned these elections, but we, we know what, what was happening uh, last year during the regional elections. So do you think that uh, this kind of uh, atmosphere in society was 
sometimes driving uh, the decisions of the government more than, for example, uh, some kind of uh, expertise from people who are really aware of uh, the problems. Um, the government or the prime minister definitely use a lot of, a lot of data from public opinion for their own purposes and decisions. Uh, they didn't use data for trying to get public calm, relaxed, and uh, f f to feel them safe. The only exception is partial use of data about, uh, about vaccination, uh, why some groups of people do not want to be vaccinated uh, and how to handle with it with this i was uh, all the two years i was quite close to uh, groups who are trying to offer to not only to the government but also to its administrative some data and it was completely useless and on the other hand i have to mention that Maybe the, the, the fault is on my side, definitely, yeah, because I'm not so good enough to be hurt. Uh, but the trouble is that uh, ministries do not want to uh, share data even during this time. They do not want to share data about schools, about pupils uh, who are uh, in quarantine and so on, which is key to uh, decide how to continue with this uh, with this epidemical situation. So my answer is quite skeptical. Uh, on the other hand, we cannot uh, expect that this will change during half of the year, even though uh, the government might change or not. This will take like five to seven years at least. Thank you, thank you very much. We have uh, more questions from our ad audience and I'm again giving floor to, to other people to ask uh, their question. Uh, we are here to, to reply to you, but uh, let's go back to our Slido questions. We, we saw that they are quite tricky, so let's continue with this. Uh, another question for Mr. Gruber. Uh, it's uh, related to the WHO organization you, you spoke before. Uh, the thing is that in the beginning of uh, the crisis, um, the information that uh, the organization provided where um, we all know what, what was happening, that um, the, the start of the COVID crisis was a bit mystery, and it is still a mystery. Uh, do you think that uh, this issue undermined uh, people's trust in the WHO organization? Of course, <laughs> it's quite simple, but no, it, it, it's a reality and, uh, it, you know, I would like to balance it because it's it's so easy to be critical about WHO uh, because they, they fail again and again, unfortunately, it's a reality. Uh, I think that the mandate of WHO is quite difficult and, and that puts them in a bit uh, unfair position because uh, the expectations are quite high and the tools they in reality have are quite limited and they are not independent in financing. Again, we get back to the finances when you depend on the on the uh, on the national state's contribution, which are not granted, but depends on the will of the political representation that that makes you quite prone to the to being manipulated or to being over the influence of of your important donor. So, in these terms, uh, the position of WHO is is difficult. And maybe I just had one slide. I know, but I just wanted to react what uh, what Ms. Nerudova mentioned about the data. I'm like absolutely aligned, and 
I don't want to jump on the fact like uh, the big data is so fashionable thing, but uh, I wanted to pick one good example how you can work with data in a smart way. Uh, and it's related, we did not talk at all about the mental health and all the impact o on the society in terms of the mental health. And I found, an one, uh, I found a really nice example how you can uh, look on the growing level of anxiety uh, of the people during the, the during the COVID pandemics, it was in the United States, and it was the fact that shelter dogs became virtually empty. So then it really shows you that those living in single households probably did face quite some anxiety if they simply run to the for the dogs and cats to the shelters. So for me, this is the way you do not dig to the special data. You just need to think smart and get the things out of it as they are around you and, and you can conclude out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much for direction. Uh, again, I'm asking our audience uh, if there is anybody who would like to. Yes, I can see. Uh, please. Uh, the man in the... Yeah, my name is Sivo Kapran, and uh, I would like to ask you, Mrs. Nergova, about the uh, new economic and political model, because uh, uh, I suppose uh, it's already about 12 years when uh, uh, George Soros said that uh, uh, we are living uh, in some society, in some system which is not existing, but uh, we still believe uh, to it. And uh, we see that we are in the end because uh, uh, the results of German elections are practically one to one to one. That is a good result that there are no extremists, only about 10, 15 percent. But as already uh, Karl Schwarzenberg said, that in any nations are some magors. <clears throat> So 15% is not so much. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this rest is divided between Green and Liberals, uh, Social Democrats, and uh, People's Party. And uh, practically, uh, they, uh, their approach to the uh, lifestyle in the future, to all these aspects of the life, are very different. I have been already uh, three years ago in some conference on European uh, uh, pillar of social rights, and uh, <clears throat> there was these experts, uh, mainly from social policies uh, in the EU, and uh, they warn about, they try to persuade everyone to avoid uh, this uh, fight between social rights and between environmental rights. Uh, and uh, now you see from these uh, uh, smart journalists who are commenting uh, the results of German elections, that practically social democrats cannot make any coalition with these uh, liberals and greens. Maybe they are representing some interests. People's Party is, represent, or said, is uh, representing uh, interests uh, all their life. Uh, uh, and uh, thanks to them, uh, we are living in Europe without war from 1950. Uh, but uh, you see also in the European Parliament, there is the progressivist group, which is Greens, Liberals, and uh, uh, social, social, Socialists and Democrats and the People's Party is not there. So, uh, so you maybe understand what I want to ask you. This is uh, how we can jump uh, uh, across uh, from uh, the one system to the other without any war, because uh, it's uh, practically impossible in Europe, uh, and without uh, uh, giving uh, uh, 10, 20 years chance to extremists, which is not uh, now very, uh, very possible because uh, the German selections were uh, where they are, and I think in France uh, also Marie Le Pen is, is slashing down. Uh, so uh, what, what, do you, what, do you, what could you say about this? Thank you very much. Please. Um... 
Thank you very much for, for this question, even though that I'm not, uh, I'm the economist so, and director of the university, so I shouldn't comment the, the politics and political situation. Anyhow, I would like, I would like to talk about the difference uh, between uh, uh, Europe and the United States. For the first, um, every society, sooner or later, will start to ask whether the model in which the society is living is functioning. COVID caused that we started to ask sooner than we probably would ask because COVID was the catalyst and it really revealed that, the, that we have a serious problem, that we have a serious problem with climate because probably you are aware of the fact that especially in the Czech Republic, we had a few, uh, maybe Mar Martin could comment, but we had a, a great part of the society which was still not sure that there is any problem with the climate change. But during the lockdown, they probably took the dogs from the shelters and they have been walking uh, with the dogs in, in the wood and they have found out that there is no wood because we have this small beetle who just eight majority of the wood and that it has not been on the table when they've been young. So in that respect, uh, I think that all, all, um, all the, um, all the um, data analysis or um, all the researches you are doing is showing that really vast majority of society thinks that the climate change is a serious problem, which is different 10 years ago. But in the United States, you always need to have a driver. In the United States, the driver of the green transition is the capital. The biggest institutional investors in the United States are pension funds. Pension funds in the United States, they do have completely different role than in Europe. They are really, they are huge. And they started to make the, um, or withdraw from the investments which has not been environment friendly. Without, without the government telling them to do it, it was the pressure of the society. It was the pressure of local governments and pressure of the society, which is slightly different in Europe, because in Europe, uh, the first driver was not the capital. First driver was kind of social engineering of the European Union. However, uh, the situation is really changing. You can see the huge businesses trying to be green. You can even see those green investments and the banks which are not willing to uh, lend you money for the projects which are not environment friendly. So uh, from my point of view, uh, the key in all this is that uh, the change needs to come from the business and from the capital, from the pressure of the society and cannot be done artificially. And even in, uh, even in this era, we are facing a lot of disinformation, like for example, that if we will decarbonize the economy, we will lose three, four, five percent of GDP and so on. But I think that we should take uh, good lectures, for example, from United Kingdom, because United Kingdom has zero emissions in, uh, in 2050. They already reduced by 50 percent. And if you look on the graph, GDP is still growing and CO2 emissions are still decreasing. Of course, that you can admit that the structure of UK is different than the structure of uh, the structure of the economics is different than structure of, of the Czech Republic. But this is what I've been stressing in every discussion, especially the discussions uh, about our presidency that this agenda, the green transition, should be the top agenda of the Czech Republic because we have the portion of industry 28%. Uh, however, the average in EU is 21%. So we are going to be hit 
quite heavily by this green transition and we need to have a strategy and also the businesses which are hit are requiring government to have a strategy because we have regions which are going to be hit very strongly. And if we are not uh, be able to handle the situation, to have a strategy of transformation, those regions are going to be the radicals in the society because they will lose while the other society will, uh, will get more. So that's my, that's my answer, not commenting uh, politics, but trying to give the picture of the United States and the transition and European and the transition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Buchtik. Follow-up question uh, to you. Do you think that the society is uh, willing uh, to, to do this dramatic change? Uh, is there a kind of demand from the society for the change? Well, yes, there is demand, but that's all. Uh, we block a lot of uh, ways how to do it, the change. Uh, it's not only about the climate change, uh, it's also about, um, I don't know, so social, social programs, uh, economical situation, and uh, so on. So it's difficult. So the Czech society is great when we are talking about um, looking for troubles and um, show, showing up, that, well, this is a trouble. Well, we solve it, and the, the, we are, but we are quite bad when uh, talking about supporting some uh, unpopular things. So it's very difficult, and it's it's very visible during the campaign that no one wants to tell you that there will be tax increase in some way. Definitely, that retired people in maybe 20, certain. Danusia Nerudava is <laughs> bigger expert than me. Uh, in 20 years, will do not have enough money, and so on. So. If I may react, because I think it's not that often mentioned, but what was just said, you know, the the, the challenge of the climate change and the social inequalities, in my eyes, it's really connected. And it's connected, it's interesting, I think it's connected globally and locally. Because if you see globally who contributed most to the, to the roots of the climate change is suffering least, and those who suffer most did almost contribute zero. But you can turn it to the, to the local as well, because uh, you have one percentage of the super wells which contribute most to the, to the carbon footprint and the poorest one are those suffering most. So th there is a close connection between these two, I would say, most crucial challenges Czech Republic and human humans as, as global are facing. And I think that also uh, there needs to come uh, a discussion regarding the, the, the basic elementary uh, rights because I think that on the table there is a discussion that also the access to drinkable water should be a basic uh, human right. Also the access to electric energy should be the basic human right. So I think that we are really uh, facing uh, turbulent times. I just want to uh, stress that uh, Mr. Gruber already mentioned that we are lacking solidarity. And that's why one of the reasons why WHO is so unpopular in the Czech Republic right now, because uh, the narrative of WHO is to be is solidarity, global solidarity when talking about vaccination. And it's very difficult to even talk about this uh, in the Czech Republic. And that's why it's, I just want to show that vaccination is one of the examples where solidarity doesn't work. Thank you. I have uh, one related question from our audience. Um, I think it's question, it's question for you, Mr. Buhtik. Um, how's the pandemic deepening inequalities 
in uh, Czech society. I know you already mentioned it in your presentation because the the second question uh, from uh, our audience is uh, what are the most affected groups of uh, the society? Uh, the most affected groups are uh, people with low income, people just uh, lo lower educated people, older lower educated people, and uh, of course s single mothers and so on. Uh, when talking about um, uh, division in society, it, in general, savings are getting higher and higher in the Czech population, but they are accumulated in higher 30 or 25 percent of, of households, and the crisis hit it um, lowest 20 or 15 percent the most. So there is increase of inequality, which is not. Um, uh, which is not so strongly perceived. It, this will not uh, be the case of this um, election because people who are poor are uh, not taking part in elections in general. So it's not a topic for right now, but we see that inequality is getting higher and not only income inequality, but especially the um, inequalities when talking about pre property inequalities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, similar question to Mr. Gruber. Um, we are not, uh, or the problem is not only inequality in the Czech society, but we have great problem with inequality globally. Uh, do you think that, um, let's say, the relations or like the gap between kind of uh, rich West and the poor uh, developing countries is now bigger and deeper? Uh, what, do, what do you think about these deepening inequalities uh, between the Western and developing world? Yes, I want to say it. I think with this question you can start another two days conference, <laughs> which would be related to this to this topic. It's uh, there is so many aspects. Uh, unfortunately, all the data shows that the gap is is widening. Um, uh, probably we should first talk about taxing tax paradise uh, being the the heaviest contribution. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, the, the 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 capacity of uh, for example capacity of the sub-Saharan uh, uh, state administration to to tax multinational corporations and uh, uh, tax optimization of these corporations. So, the, so there is a lot of topics and probably. I'm a bit pessimistic, like, yeah, we, we so far we struggle to find a way out of it, even though, and again, uh, there are organizations which put the data on the table. It's not that difficult to, to prove it, to see where the problem is, but to solve the problem, you, you need uh, you need a quite big consensus between whatever, 100, uh, 160, uh, governments, which is which is really difficult to to get. Uh, uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, I can see more question from our audience. Uh, please, the floor. Alica Kizakova, Institute of International Relations, Prague. Uh, one of the organizers. Um, I just really like this discussion because uh, you touched some points that are actually underlining. Um, I guess goal of this event is to bring together um, NGOs or people experts with the governmental um, officials and journalists, students, public, and have a conversation. But as you can see, uh, it's really hard to pinpoint how many actually uh, civil servants are sitting. So you come to the house of the uh, policy making and um, I imagine people are sitting online in their office maybe watching. But that's an issue here. We are in a hybrid world. 
yet we are saying the crisis might be almost over, um, I find it's a big failure because we wanted to have people here to actually ask the questions in person and part of the uh, growth in terms of having a um, relationship with institutions is starting to interact, um, some sort of uh, socializing uh, and actually know who you are and, and like see you interact, your facial expression. Um, so on my behalf, I find this a bit of failure because we are uh, finding excuse that there is election, but these issues were before crisis and they are ongoing and they will be there regardless of who will be in power. And um, without uh, having too much of my remarks, uh, my question here is, we know the status quo, we know some gaps, but realistically, regardless of what political spectrum you support, what is your wish list for top three priorities to be tackled, whoever will come to power in Czech Republic in your expertise? What are the things that you think should be prioritized right away as soon as it's all functional with the new government um, after the elections to improve the situation? Uh, some of them are obviously very difficult to deal with, but uh, we need to start prioritizing and the rest is on the side, obviously, in parallel world, but uh, obviously euro currency is not on the priority list. But if you can point out what you think should be done as a recommendation um, to, to help and improve um, this, uh, this sort of like disillusioned, mistrustful um, times, you know, to, to improve that. Thank you very much for this uh, question. Uh, is there anybody who would like to start? Maybe Ms. Nerudova. Yeah, thanks for, for this question. I have three uh, flagships. First, uh, consolidation of public finance, for the second, reform of education, and for the third, digitalization. Thank you, Mr. Buchtik, your three flagships. Trust in society and between groups of society as our society becomes fragmented more and more. The second thing is cooperation, starting with individual institutions, inner things of individual institutions. We can see that uh, one group in one, one at one ministry uh, is uh, in conflict with the second group and they do not share in any information, they do not want to get them uh, to, be, to be seen and to be respected and so on. And the third is uh, to be able to see good examples uh, in abroad because I think that we, do, we are tending to making a wheel again and again uh, when it was made like 30 years ago somewhere else. Uh, being sure, I think what, what was, I, I agree with everything what was mentioned, so on top, on top of that I would add executions for sure. This is easy and can be done immediately to get uh, all the or majority of the population out of the executions. Then uh, regional inequalities, I mean, the fact where you are born has such an impact on your uh, future chances uh, that uh, it's not acceptable. And the third, I think, is hope. Some hope or goal for the people, you know, to let's, uh, let's have again the good mood and, and look forward and head somewhere and smile one to each other. Yeah, thank you. I think that this kind of uh, visions and strategy for the future is very important. Uh, yesterday we uh, kind of celebrated the uh, birthday of uh, Václav Havel and I think that uh, maybe kind of visions that he had uh, would be very helpful for our society and let's hope that uh, maybe after elections there will be some more 
push for this kind of visionary uh, approach. Uh, I'm asking again our audience, uh, is there anybody who would like to ask a question? No, here's nobody, but we have uh, questions still in Slido. So I'm, I'm also encouraging our audience that is connected online to ask questions via Slido. Um, we are coming back to what was already mentioned several times, and it was one of the flagship uh, priorities uh, mentioned by Mr. Buchtik, uh, the cooperation. Uh, between institutions, government, uh, experts, uh, and uh, academic and other, other fields. And the question is, uh, why did this integration of different forms of expertise did not work during the pandemic? What was the problem? Uh, Ms. Nerudova, I know that you were among the active persons who were trying to bring people together to to provide government with uh, some insights from uh, economists. Uh, so what do you think was the barrier? There is a very simple answer, lack of leadership. Lack of leadership, there was no leadership. There was no one uh, who would be responsible for this decision and there was no one who would be uh, uh, who would be willing uh, to be responsible. So lack of leadership, this was something which was blocking the situation last one year and a half. Uh, thank you. I have a follow-up question for Mr. Gruber because uh, you also already mentioned that NGOs' role uh, is in Czech Republic is quite problematic. Also, I can see that uh, the government or the politicians are often attacking NGOs. Uh, do you think that uh, is there any like willingness or do you hope for change and do you think that the change can come that uh, NGOs uh, would become kind of a um, good player uh, for the government, uh, source of information, source of expertise. Maybe can you see some uh, changes in the future? Uh, well, I think generally we, we should start with the fact that uh, I saw problematic that the state did not use the capacities of the NGOs. I think the, the NGO and civil sector is quite strong here, actually. So uh, the, uh, let's start with the positive news. It's it's positive, it's highly expertise, it's uh, highly professional. So we have something to build upon. Uh, the non-governmental sector is doing enormous amount of the work the state is outsourcing to them and it's just not communicated. So it's just the fact, uh, let's, let's look on the reality, how it is, how much work in, especially in the social area, uh, in the area of palliative care, and I know many others, is, is outsourced by the state administration to NGOs being done super effectively. If you, if you see the real cost and if you compare the costs when the service is delivered, not, not by all, but generally by the non-governmental sector, and when the service is delivered by the state administration, usually uh, it's several times cheaper. Uh, the, wh why, why the sector is being so, so much attacked? It's attacked just by some. It's attacked by, uh, let's say, the, the, the real right wing, uh, which has a different perspective uh, of the society. And of course, strong NGOs uh, is a problem. NGOs are usually outspoken, uh, which is not uh, appreciated by some to have a strong opinion voice. Uh, but still, I, I think this is the sector where where I see where I see a lot of power and and resource for the change. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm again asking our audience if there are any any questions or comments on the issues we are discussing. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. If I can comment more, uh, I am uh, in EU affairs for 20 years, so I'm monitoring uh, what is happening in uh, more investors south of Europe. Uh, and. Uh, 
I could tell you that it's uh, not so much um, hope uh, if, there, if the system will be not changed from, <laughs> from the fundament. Because uh, uh, the same what we are, what we see, according to Mr. Buchtig in the Czech Republic, uh, we see in any country, uh, even in Italy, France, uh, Germany. Uh, in Germany, not so much because Germans uh, they are afraid of their past, and France already uh, uh, the star of Le Pen. Is, uh, is declining. Huh? Uh, so, so we are practically safe because Salvini is also, uh, also not uh, uh, such a big star as he was uh, one, two years ago. Uh, but there could be some issue on the global field. Uh, for example, the new wave of migration, <laughs> and we shall be uh, back uh, in, uh, in uh, this uh, big danger. So, uh, so Mrs. Nerudova said, okay, that, uh, that politics or political affairs are driven by capital. I agree. Uh, but uh, in, in, but we, uh, the capital is practically uh, global. Uh, so, uh, so maybe it's one of special things in the Czech Republic that we don't have uh, uh, we have two, three global players, and the others are only listening what is happening any, anywhere else. But isn't it approval of that what I said before? That <laughs> we cannot change it in the Czech Republic. We have to play on the European field. We have to be very active on all things which are uh, which are putting on the table by European Commission, as the Green Deal is. If somebody uh, doesn't like Green de Deal, we can call it Pact Vert in French. It's a million Pact Vert. So, uh, so this Pact Vert is a chance. Uh, and uh, what is the main thing we should jump over is the social and environmental groups uh, fighting. Because that is what I am afraid of, that uh, all these other things we monitored uh, or observed uh, uh, last five years is nothing against that, that one poor people will fight with other poor people who will win. And uh, maybe it is a strategy of some oligarchs uh, to manage all this space transatlantic. We, we saw last American president, so it's not fantasy. It's not fantasy. Uh, and what is, uh, what is practically Joe Biden's strategy is uh, to make together this cooperation about which uh, is, uh, is telling, uh, is talking Mr. Buchtig, uh, cooperation of all people. Maybe oligarchs will be not with us, so uh, in the Czech Republic, maybe we are losing 100 people. Uh, in the United States, maybe we are losing 100,000 people. Uh, in Russia, maybe the same. But the other people should, uh, should collaborate, not listen so much for the news which are distributing by journalists who are paying by the capital, and make their own. According to NGOs, according to other, uh, other things, other thoughts which are uh, distributing in positive way. Thank you, uh, thank you for your comment. Yes, yes, I, I can see, so the floor, floor is yours. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, my name is Yuri Laidao, Universal Peace Federation. I would like to thank to all the panelists, you know, for the, uh, the, uh, for the speeches and for the thoughts. Uh, it has been said that government failed, there is a lack of solidarity, and many other things basically describing the situation. My question is, 
how to solve what is the bigger vision it has been already asked this question but when Václav Havel was mentioned yesterday yesterday's birthday so it came to my mind he was always speaking about the significance of the meaning smysl plnost you know, the purpose of the things so i think that if we could add also to all these I would say methodological or practical things, digital, digitalization, prioritizing of certain methods and procedures to give the things meaning, deeper meaning. And I think this, this is lacking somehow. This is what I feel. And also it has been mentioned the cooperation, but I think that a good cooperation should, should be interdependence. We have dependence. We have independence, but there should be interdependence. And then it brings mutual prosperity based on universal values. So I think that maybe this could be added to the discussion. And that's why my question is, what do you think about this? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, comment and question. Uh, so I would like to now ask our panelists to react and we will start from the other side of the table. So please, Mr. Gruber, um, how to give uh, to the things we are doing the, the deeper meaning as was mentioned? Super difficult. <laughs> well, uh, you know, when I was asked the, the, the three points, my third point was hope or vision or, or goal where the society is heading. So, um, you know, I, I feel a little bit lost with this question because, like, to, to define the meaning or how how to give the people the meaning of the life, uh, probably need more, more time. Sorry. <laughs> Don't worry. Thank you, uh, Mr. Buchtik. Uh, what is your uh, answer? Uh, I'm completely in line with you. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, the, the question is, is how to do it. And I think that we have to start with politics because uh, with interdependence between public and politicians and Czech public and to be honest not only only Czech public but Czech, I'm a specialist on, on this on this society uh, Czech public perceives politics as never ending ending soap opera they uh, people see it as a place where uh, random troubles are starting and that politicians do not solve the problems of general people. And it's the place, from my perspective, where we have to start to be able to show general people who are not interested in, in politics, they, they are watching TV or like two times a week to explain them, to show them which problems have been solved in cooperation of different political parts, that politics is not never-ending war only. Yeah. We know that uh, at the end of the, uh, just, just before election, it is always, and it will be always never-ending war, but sometimes we sh have to show other uh, face of the politics. Thank you very much, and we have the last minute. Thank you. Um, well, I also completely agree, and I think that the, the um, at the moment, what in fact we have in the society is the crisis of values, crisis of basic values. Because migration and all those problems which are dealt instead of talking about the basic values just shows that we have a crisis of basic values as freedom and love. Because those are two 
basic values and there is everything in those two values because you have love uh, to truth, you have love to family and love to work and I, I, can, I can go on. So that's from, uh, from my uh, point of view and we started and that's the political culture. We started to treat our society as a corporate but we should treat our society as family. Because if there is one in family which is not so strong, you don't kick his ass, but you care about him. And what we are doing just now is that we are kicking the ass of, of, of those who are not so strong. So this is also the political culture. And for, for third, um, we are lacking the vision. We don't have the vision of the future. It's very much connected with our role in the European Union because we don't have the partners. UK is out, which has been the traditional partner of the Czech Republic. We are still uh, trying to be the part of V4, but it's just a political project with, without economic substance. No businesses are caring about V4. And we are really facing serious problem in the EU because we don't know where we are. We don't know whether we want more integration. We don't know whether we want more independence. And it's really difficult to have a vision, a strategy if, if you don't know. And of course, that we need to be the part of, of uh, some broader platform. This is something which the, the crisis showed that really if the Czech Republic would buy the vaccines by itself, I am pretty sure that we wouldn't have been vaccinated at the moment. This is something which should be, should be set aloud, that we have vaccines due to the EU, EU, even though that we have been criticizing EU as that it was not at acting at all, but as, as Pavel said, it couldn't act if we have not given them the right to act, of course. <laughs> and um, and not, it's not only about the European uni Union, but it's also about NATO, because that's the second platform. We have to very strongly shout in the public space that it was to be part of NATO, even after, after uh, the thing in Afghanistan. And we have to also say aloud from the economic perspective, we are the free riders all the time in the EU. We are the free riders and we always think that Germans will solve the economic problem of, uh, of the Czech Republic, but that's not true. We have, we have to have the vision uh, and we have to know what to do in the green transition because our economic is different than the German ones. Thank you very much. I think this was a great wrap up of uh, the whole discussion we, we had. I think that uh, the discussion was about the impacts of COVID, but as you can see, um, these impacts are more in kind of shedding a light on problems and challenges we were already facing before COVID and COVID only accelerated the need for the change. And for this change, we need the leadership, the visions, and the strategy how to how to solve it i would like to thank thank a lot to our panelists for their great insightful contributions i would like to thank to all our audience for all your questions and comments i think it was a quite interesting discussion and i hope you enjoyed it as much as i did so thank you very much and enjoy the rest of the program of the international symposium thank you very much